Artist and found object assembler Willie Cole has lived and worked in New Jersey his entire life. A 1998 exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art helped to cement his international reputation. In 2006, the Montclair Art Museum has mounted a retrospective exhibit of his work dating back to the late 1980s. Well, because I was in school in the 60s, African art, African awareness was very prevalent. And in our community, there was a place called, I think it was called the Spirit House. And it was the headquarters of a cultural dynasty, I should say, uh, founded by Amiri Baraka. There were poetry readings, there were touring dance companies, there was African clothing, there was drumming. In the 60s, a lot of African Americans really got a huge awareness of the Africanness in their Americanness. And in Newark, it came through Amiri Baraka. My first approach to art making was two-dimensional, uh, partly because growing up as a kid in the city of Newark, the thing that my father brought home from work was paper and pencil. I was pretty much a drawer and a painter, and I worked in that field as a graphic designer and illustrator for years before I started doing three-dimensional work. So I found that my children had been very inspirational for me in that they always seem to know the latest trend. 20 years ago, Cole's oldest child helped steer his father in an entirely new direction. At the time, my son was playing with these toys called Transformers. In the package, it would look like a car, but you would twist it and then it would become an airplane or become a lion or a panther or a bird or even a gun sometimes. So that got my mind thinking about transforming things, which is kind of what I do now. In his hands, old discarded hair dryers become a mask. Wooden matchsticks are transformed into a chicken. And fragments from old porcelain bathroom fixtures suggest erotic pleasures. The ordinary household iron has become one of Willie Cole's most important objects. I one day saw an iron on the street that had been run over by a car. So it didn't have any depth to it. It was flat, like a mask, and it actually looked like an African mask. So that discovery led me to bring the iron into my studio and photograph it, and through the camera, I began to see it different ways. So I made a list of, uh, like a word association game, based on what that photograph said to me. And of course, the top of the list was the word iron. Uh, the, probably the second word on that list. At that time, for me, it, it probably was Ogun. Ogun, who would be the uh, African uh, god or the Yoruba god of iron. And so that made the third word Africa, which probably made the fourth word black, also because the handle of the iron was black. Then my next word would be servant. If I drew a line to connect the word Africa and the word servant, then my next word is going to be slave. So, and it just went on and on like that until I had a long list. And that list just yielded uh, inspiration for, for decades. Once I acquire a quantity of an object, and then that object just becomes a building block, like a, a Lego or a Tinker Toy or something like that. So I found myself in possession of thousands of shoes. <laughs> and people have spoke to me about this. They've asked me, why do I use high heel shoes? Do I have a shoe fetish and all those kind of things? And my choosing high heel shoes came because my son had saved all of his sneakers so by age 11, he had a lot of sneakers, and I wanted to make something out of them. But I came to that idea with a picture in my mind of what I wanted to make, and there were not enough shoes to make that. So I went to the thrift store, and when I got to the store, I realized the most dominant shoe there was the high heel shoe. And in fact, the high heel shoe looked better than the sneakers. It had more options, it had more shapes, it had more color, more texture, and for me, more energy. 
After having uh, a pile of shoes and playing with them for hours a day and weeks, maybe even almost a whole month, I was able to see a group of white ones as teeth. And once I had teeth, then now I suddenly I had a concept. And because they were female shoes, I felt they had to have female names. And I chose the colors red, black, and white because they were the dominant colors in my shoe collection. But those three colors were like in the tradition of the Yoruba of Nigeria, the colors of the warrior. So I thought of the black women who were revolutionary in their lifetime, who brought great change or awareness to society. So I named them after those women, uh, Hattie McDaniels, or Hollywood revolutionary. Rosa Parks, Harriet Tubman, and militant activist Joanne Chesimard are also in the group. The work behind me was inspired by the art of Tibet. Demon-like, at least in appearance, figures that are the protectors of Tibetan Buddhism. Some of them have kind of dragon-like faces. It's still the act of touching the object, feeling the object, and you know, just being in the tangible world with the object that leads to the, to the work. You have to forget what the material is, and the more of it you have, the easier it is. Like, I'm looking at you, and I can forget that you're a bunch of cells, because there's so many cells there, they stack up and they become a human. So it's the same thing with, with any material.